one of the one of the most versatile musicians we have. He's the leader of the Chris Johnson group. Uh, he's toured uh, with the Count Basie Orchestra, playing venues like the Apollo Theater, the Blue Note Jazz Club, the Sydney Opera House, the Blues Alley, Hollywood Bowl. Um, he's played at Jazz at Lincoln Center with Wynton Marcellus, Tony Bennett, Patty Austin. My gosh. Um, as a writer, he's written film scores, documentary, short films, feature films. Um, he's he worked recently with the Plow, probably still working with the Plowshares Theater, um, in partnership with Kresge Foundation, and um, <clears throat> recently wrote the music, uh, scored Hastings Street the musical, which I saw not too long ago, was really awesome. Um, actually, oh, right over here at at, at Music Hall. Um, he was awarded a grant in 2014 from New Music USA to fund a studio recording of Jim Crow's Tears um, in a, uh, with a book by Gary Anderson uh, as an educator. Uh, he was the director of jazz studies in Utah from 2015 to 2019, uh, project director for the Pontiac School District. He was on faculty at Ohio State, um, worked as a civic youth um, meant, uh Worked as a teacher at the Detroit Symphony Civic Youth. In fact, that's where I think I met you a long time ago. Um, uh, he's currently an artistic liaison at Jazz Ed Detroit, um, and am proud to work for him at at uh, Michigan State's Community Music School, where he's the our director of music there. So, um, heck of a resume. And as good as all this stuff is, um, one of my favorite things about Chris is he's a beautiful person also. So it's my, my pleasure as a um, board member of the Michigan Jazz Festival to introduce you or bring you to Chris Johnson. Thank you so much, Chris, for coming. Well, wow. <clears throat> Scott, thank you so much. That's a beautiful, beautiful introduction. And um, yeah, man, I, should, I, I need to pay you to, to, to come and introduce me everywhere I go nuts. I can't get better than that. Thank you. It means a lot. And of course, I have a tremendous amount of respect for all the work that you've done in the community um, and, and the path that you've set for so many of us. Um, absolutely an inspiration for, for many, many years. Um, I remember early on when I was in college uh, doing a couple of gigs with your big band, I think during some of the early days of the Bells. Um, definitely inspired my journey towards having my own big band. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with everyone. Thank you so much for, for welcoming me. Um, hearing back that, I get tired sometimes <laughs> hearing back some of the things, but I think what's always interesting is I always love to kind of share what inspired uh, kind of that path of, of the, the many things that I've done with my career. Uh, I remember I was at Michigan State University and I was in graduate school. I was coming out with my master's. When I was coming out of my undergrad, in my mind, oh, I'm just going to graduate of my bachelor's in jazz and I'm just going to start teaching. Well, it seemed like at the time that I was coming out with my bachelor's degree, all of a sudden there were more master's degree in jazz. And everybody said, oh, well, to teach at the university level, you're going to have to have a master's degree. So, you know, I was coming out of undergrad in 2005. I said, okay, all right, great. I'll go ahead and stay on and just get my master's degree. By the time I was coming out with my master's degree, everyone's saying, well, if you want to teach at the university level, you need to have a doctorate. And I'm just like, oh, God. So it's my, my last year of graduate school, and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And I'm just freaking out, having a crisis. And I was sitting down with my uh, college trumpet professor, Derek Gardner, phenomenal musician, if you're not familiar, um, just amazing composer, arranger, trumpet player, person. Um, and I remember him giving me a list. And I don't think he knew how literal I was. I'm a very literal person. But he started giving me a list of just different things I could do. I really think he was just trying to calm me down. I'm like, Derek, what am I going to do? I'm about to get married, I'm, you know, going through these things. And he really broke it down to me. He said, you know, well, Chris, think about it. You could play gigs as a sideman. You could lead gigs uh, as, a, as a band leader. You can rec uh, do recording sessions uh, for horn sections. You could play with a big band. You could go on tour. You could be a copyist. You could uh, arrange for orchestras. You could, he started just, you could be an administrator. He starts listing off all these different avenues and I took it, I wish I still had those notes, but I was taking like notes and I started going through and really just pursuing like, I'd say about 10 to 15 things all at once because I was, I was highly motivated. I was about to be on my own, about to be out of college and really thinking about what is my path to success going to be? And really the way that I think of it is kind of like, it's like a funnel or, or an up, upside down pyramid, depending on the way you want to look at it. At first it was really about let me just try out as many things as possible 
and see what happens. So I just started like dumping things into this funnel, just trying to figure out what was going to happen. So uh, I remember going over to, uh, even when I was in college, started going over to several high schools and saying, great, uh, do you need, do you want someone to come teach lessons? So I could go do a free master class and try to get some students. And then eventually that turned into some artists and resident positions. I started going out to different orchestras and different bands and just, you know, or different gospel artists saying, I, I can record horns, I can do this. There's a website back in the day called Mandy.com that some of you probably remember where you could go search for film opportunities. And I was on Mandy.com and I was applying like, I, I, I'm a composer, I wanna write for film. And so I started putting everything into this funnel and then certain things started actually making it through at the bottom. But what I found, and this is like one of the, the key things for me, is the more that I put in at the top of the funnel, the more energy I put into just trying things out, and the more that I learned from my incredible amount of mistakes, I'm talking so many mistakes, so many times falling on my face, but what happened is all these lessons came out at the bottom. So it really wasn't about you know, did I make money from this venture or did I become an expert over here? It was more so about, I was really a scientist. I was really doing experiments and applying the scientific method and figuring out if I do this, what's the result gonna be? If I try this, what's gonna result gonna be? The next time that I do this, I'm gonna say this instead of this, what's the result gonna be? And to me, that was one of the things that really started to set me apart, I think from some of my peers, is that my focus was very, very broad. And then when I started to find what worked for me, which is gonna be different for every person, then I was able to start to find some lanes. I started finding that I was in different lanes that a lot of my peers weren't in because everybody was doing the gigging thing. And of course, I still gig now. I still think it's essential, still a major part of my background, but it wasn't the top pillar. It wasn't the only thing that was there. Uh, Miss Mickey, I just got something you said. Volume is non exit. Are you guys having a hard time hearing me? We're okay. A little bit. I'll cut my volume up. I'm up. All right. Up one more notch. Is that a little bit better? Okay. Thanks for letting me know. All right. Great. So for me, I think what was really key was putting in as much as possible on the top of that funnel and then really paying attention, not just doing it and then burning out, but really paying attention to what came out at the bottom of that. And so what I found is there's a couple of areas that really started to stand out. One, I started to realize that if I was able to position myself to be useful in a way that was unique as a problem solver and as someone who was really dependent, um, dependable, then I could find myself in certain circles and start to do all the normal things but then on top of that, really be able to break out and find some other areas of success. So one major area that popped up was all throughout college, um, I was really serious about music notation, really serious about like making my charts look super, super clean. And I remember an opportunity, and that's really what this is about, is recognizing opportunities and learning from them. It's gonna be different for each person. But for me, music notation and making charts look clean was something that was really important. A good friend of mine that I went to college with, uh, her name is uh, Lynn Grunewald, a great alto saxophone player. She was doing a lot of copyist work. She had just moved to New York. I was still in Michigan. And she's doing a lot of copyist work for different people. She actually had done a couple things for Wynton Marcellus, just kind of as a copyist assistant and was doing some work for Wycliffe Gordon. Well, I remember every time she got stuck on a project, she would call me like, hey, Chris, how do you do blah, 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 and finale? And I didn't think of anything of it. All my friends would always call me asking me questions about finale and, and how to do it, but I never monetized it. And really, that's one of the biggest lessons I learned is I, just, I wasn't thinking about monetizing the fact that people were asking me for advice on a number of different things. But I remember one day she called me and it was a little bit different. She said, hey, I got the Wyclef has this big project he's doing for Brass Band of Battle Creek. And, uh, I can't do it. I'm just not in a position where I can get it done because I'm doing some other work over here. You know, could you step in and do this job? And I'd known Wyclef because he had done some teaching at, um, at at MSU. And I did the job. And I remember I just, you know, I think I got it back to him the same night, just very efficient, uh, made sure I had my communication, all the things that I really valued. And he said right then, he's like, all right, I'm never using another copy as again. You're my person for as long as you're willing to do this. And I've been working with him since 2010. So for like the last 12 years, every time Wyclef has a commission come up or every time he needs a chart for a website or anything like that, 
he's shooting it over to me. He's shooting it over to me and I'm cleaning up. I'm getting paid to do that. So all of a sudden that sparked something in me because I had never, this is something that I was doing for free. This is advice that I was giving out for free all the time. And suddenly it was like, wow, in my mind, I'm going to go tour with my own band. In my mind, it was, I'm going to make this connection and make this connection. But then I started to notice really what it was is I had to listen to the funnel and listen to what was happening within the funnel. And what I noticed is when I listened, the answers that came back were different from the answers that I wanted to hear. And oftentimes this is the case. And what I found was, wow, my ability to be responsible, efficient, and quick with work is something that is valued. My advice that I'm giving to other musicians who want to get work is something that is valued and something that I can charge for. And once I started to understand that, things really started to come together for me in a very different way. Suddenly I was doing a lot of copyist work for Y Club. Suddenly I was doing more arranging work for other people. And then I really started getting even more serious about education, even to the point where eventually I started my own uh, web series talking about Finale. The first one, I think I called Finale Nerd. I like tried to play up the nerd thing. It was I was on on YouTube and I put on these like, glasses that didn't actually have lenses in them and I was like I I'm I'm the finale nerd and I had these glasses I mean it was really terrible it's probably still out there somewhere later on I rebranded it as notation nerd but it was like I couldn't keep up with it I, I was too shy on camera I was like terrified to like go out like that but I was trying things out now for a while I thought man I really failed at that but then years and years later, I had the idea for something called Office Hours with Chris Johnson, which is a company that I'm still running to this day, which is a portal of online courses that I teach and walk people through. I had to learn so many things and fall on my face in so many ways before I could get to that point. So the biggest point that I want uh, everyone to really think about, and I do want to take a moment and answer any questions that might come up, is... What is it that you could be pouring into your funnel right now? What are some things that are maybe even outside of the box that you may not be doing on a day-to-day -day basis while still maintaining the way that you make your livelihood for music, while still maintaining the things that you do that you've already found success in? But how can we all be good stewards of the many gifts that we're given? What are the things that stand out to you? You're on the gig and someone compliments you on something that isn't just you played that song really well. What are the things that go beyond? Man, you sounded killing. There's usually something else that is unique about us that we can find a way to monetize. The next part of this, um, but I want to kind of get to questions on this first section, but the next part I want to put in everybody's mind is once you identify what that is, what infrastructure do you have set up so that it is easy and streamlined for you to be able to profit from whatever that unique property of you is. So let's just first start start off. If anybody wants to volunteer either in the chat or even come on microphone and talk about what is something that's unique about you that you want to monopolize on or that you want to really learn more about yourself in or what specific questions do you have about how to find that and how to start thinking outside the box. Okay, so I see a question from Colin. Do you have ideas for discovering these unique qualities in our students? Absolutely. Um, uh, Colin, I think one of the best things that we can do is to expose our students to as many different types of people and different walks of life as possible. So I know for me, I had no idea. I didn't really understand what being a music administrator was, an arts administrator was. And so, of course, I, you know, there was a dean, you know, at the college I went to. I've seen principals. But no one had really walked me through, this is what this person does. This is how much money this person makes. This is the type of retirement plan that this person has. I didn't really understand how someone went from the path of professional musician into the world of administration. But when I started to have some conversations with my high school band director, Damian Crutcher, um, he started really letting me know, hey, here's my life as a conductor. Here's my life as an educator. Here's some administrative things that I'm doing. Here's some people that I can put you in front of. And this is after college. And my first job, my first salary job was working for the Pontiac School District. 
they had an arts and education model and dissemination grant from the Department of Education. <clears throat> With that grant, they needed a project director. I ended up being a project director and got trained, uh, actually went down to DC and got trained on how to run this particular type of grant, all the things we're supposed to do. But suddenly this world of administration opened up and, and for me, a light bulb went off and it's like, man, I'm, I'm pretty organized. I understand like leadership a little bit. This appeals to me. I'm curious about this. There might have been someone else that did the same thing. Like, I hate this so much. This is terrible. I want to run away from it. But I would say, Colin, the biggest thing is for your students is they're not really going to understand it until they're exposed to it. Even if it's a decade later that they say, man, I remember this one time, you know, I was at a Saginaw Valley State and and someone came in and talked to me about being a, a video game composer. And I wasn't interested at the time, but suddenly that that really appeals to me. And so I think that's one of the best ways that we can expose our students to that. Miss Mickey said there is not much. Well, Miss Mickey, you've done you've done everything. You've done so much, uh, so so accomplished. Um, absolutely. Um, so in terms of, if you don't mind, do you want to expand on that that feeling of of edged out? I'd love to either hear you say something about it or type about it if you want to, because I'd love to to dive into that more. But anything else around any other synergy around this idea of thinking outside the box or being able to monopolize on our unique skills? Wonderful. Well, I'm happy to dive into the next part of this. One thing that I do want to point out, and this is just one thing I'll say, is I know there were a lot of opportunities that I wanted when I was in my 20s, when I was in my early 30s, that it was like no one saw me in that light because of my age. I had a certain skill set, there were certain things that I wanted to do, but I was looking for the types of things that I'm now able to do with ease as I'm starting to get a little bit older. Like, you know, I'm 39, so I'm starting to get a little bit older, but at least the perception is, oh, this person is capable of doing X, Y, Z. So one of the things I'll say is that there's something about a different approach that's taken when you're seasoned. And obviously I only know seasoned up to 39, if you can consider that to be seasoned, but I'll say that there's something about being a monopolize on the fact that the perception immediately is we have a certain perception of what a young person is capable of or certain things that a young person can do that an older person can't and vice versa. But when we're able to lean into and take advantage of what that looks like, what are the doors that are easy to open because of where we are in life? I think that's really essential. So the next thing I talked about was the infrastructure. Um, if nobody has any, any more questions or, or comments about kind of finding these ideas. The infrastructure is really important. And I think this is the place where a lot of people tend to really struggle. And I, I get a lot of questions around this and I hear a lot of frustration around infrastructure even if people don't necessarily recognize that it's infrastructure. I think sometimes what happens is we have this big idea or we have this big gig or we have this big opportunity but we're not able to get that to the next thing. How do we take one thing and then elevate it? And I think part of it is the difference be for me between thinking like an artist and thinking like a business is that I'm able to apply as an artist. I'm very, very sensitive as an artist. I'm going to be very expressive as an artist. I'm coming from my emotions. I'm being led by my art as a business person. I have to be very objective as a business person. I have to be very strategic and I'm putting on a different hat and thinking in a different way and thinking about how do I take this one opportunity and make it lead towards something else. So an example, there's two examples that I like to give. Um, one example in terms of that strategy or one, one example in terms of trying to think in that way is when I first joined the Count Basie Orchestra. I got the opportunity through a recommendation. I feel very, very lucky. I feel very fortunate. Derek Gardner recommended me for it. I was in the right place at the right time. And that's how most of our gigs and most of our opportunities come up. Something happens and we're in the right place at the right time and we're very fortunate that it happens. We've all seen it. That's the synergy of the way that the arts work and it's beautiful. Question is, once we get that opportunity, 
are we going to just be comfortable with exactly what that is? Or are we going to think about how we can scale and how we can level that up? I think one thing that's really interesting to study is we look at like the history of Amazon as a book company. And we look at the, the model that Amazon used and we look at what happened with Amazon and how they turn into the business that they are. There's a constant sense of scaling and a constant sense of developing and moving and kind of redirecting the direction of the business. In that same way, I'll say that when I joined the Basie Orchestra at first, it's like, I'm just so happy to be here. I'm happy to just be playing my, my third trumpet part and going on tour and doing some solos. But immediately I was like, well, I write and I really want to learn how to arrange in this style. And I really want to write for the Basie band. And it became a, a, a dream of, I am ready. I want to be able to write for this orchestra. So immediately I start asking questions. I talked to the band leader, talked to Bill, the late Bill Hughes. And I said, you know, hey, I'd like to submit some arrangements for the band to play. Is that a possibility? Well, what I need to do? I talked to the other musicians. Have any of you ever had any of your charts written? And they're looking at me because I'm like 23, 24, uh, the youngest guy in the band. But I'm like, I don't want to write for the group. And they're like, okay, all right, calm down. But for me, that was important because I was immediately thinking about how do I scale this? How do I take it from being a touring musician and being a member of this group to being able to write for this group? Because that's, that's where my heart is. That's where my mind is. That's my particular opportunity of where I want to go. So while we're on tour, the band leader's like, you know what? Bring some charts to soundcheck. We'll read them. I said, okay, great. So I remember I wrote uh, an arrangement of uh, the uh, Ben Webster tune, Did You Call Her Today? And I had already had the arrangement written. I did some tweaks. Uh, this is still in the days where you had to like, there was no Uber. I like caught a cab, went over to a FedEx Kinko's with like a little memory stick, went in, got it printed, taped the parts, brought them into soundcheck. We read them and the band just, they just destroyed it. They just were like, oh man, that's, the tenors are in the wrong range. Uh, this voicing doesn't work over here. Isn't this the same changes in a mellow tone? Oh man, we got Frank Foster's in a mellow tone. We don't need another chart over those changes. No, nah, that's never going to work. We're not going to play this. Now, again, to me, that's looking at that funnel. As I'm thinking about that funnel and coming down, I'm pouring in this energy and that didn't come out at the bottom. Again, it was an opportunity. I was like, all right, cool. I could get stuck. But I took all those notes, went back, wrote another chart. I was like, all right, great. Let me try all these different things they talked about. Someone said, oh, man, well, you know, in every bassy chart, you got to have a moment where everything breaks down. You hear nothing but just the piano with the rhythm section, the solo, and then it goes back into the shout. You didn't do that. Now, again, instead of being defensive or instead of just like giving up, I was like, all right, cool. Let me go back and try that again because I'm not thinking emotionally. I'm thinking strategically. If we think about like why is Netflix so successful and why is Blockbuster non-existent? Because Netflix adapted. There's a great documentary about it, by the way, about, about the downfall of, of Blockbuster. But my thought is, how do I adapt? So the next thing I did was I started studying the style more, studying particular recordings, asking the guys who gave me criticism what recordings to listen to, and then went back and, and made some changes. Finally, uh, Marcus Belgrave's tune, All My Love, I did an arrangement of that tune, and the band loved it. And we started playing it on the road. Now, again, it's like, all right, that's great. We're playing it on the road. Man, this is this beautiful. That, you know, we first played it when we were in Rome. This is, this is really exciting. I'm not satisfied. That's cool. That's really great. I want to get one of my arrangements recorded by the Basie Band. Now, many, many years went by. Had two kids in the middle. Was off the road for a bit. But when I was invited to come back to the Basie Orchestra after I had left for about three years, in my mind, I said, okay, I'm coming back. I've done a lot of arranging since then. I'm getting more of my material recorded by the band. Christmas record ends up coming up after I'd done a couple of arrangements for the road and Scotty Barnhart asked me to arrange something for the band. I arranged Let It Snow and Sleigh Ride. Let It Snow needed a lot of changes, needed a lot of edits, but I was like, okay, great. I understand you guys don't like this figure. You don't like this figure. And we're like at the studio. And so the producer's like, I don't know if this chart's going to work. It's, it's almost there, but there's too many changes. And I said, and, and they had already cut Sleigh Ride. They were like, Sleigh Ride, Chris, you went to 3-4. You did a tempo change. You did all, like a New Orleans feel. It's not, it's not going to work. It's just, this is not going to happen. So I was like, all right, Sleigh Ride got cut. It's not going to happen to let us know. So again, how do I adapt? My way of adapting was, okay, 
give me all the notes. So I'm marking it on the score. The whole time I'm marking on the score, everyone's telling me, Chris, no, we're not going to record this chart. It's not going to work out. Maybe next time. I said, no, 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 just give me the changes. I went and collected everybody's music, spread it out on the table in, in Capitol Records in LA, and I started just making the changes to everybody's charts. We went back in and we read it down and the changes all landed. And I was like, okay, so what did I learn from this? It wasn't necessarily about, am I a good enough arranger? Cause I didn't change the, I didn't change what I wrote. I actually just took some stuff away. It was about how adaptable am I? And then the next time we went in, I wrote about three arrangements for the next record. And I just got through writing about, I'm not even in the band anymore, but in the middle of doing Hastings Street, the musical, I was writing four arrangements for a new record that they just got through recording. It became about, am I dependable and am I adaptable? Do I have that skill set to be able to adapt? Then the bigger thing that came up was, what are the skills that I need to be able to have to back up this information? And I think the major thing that came up that I need to be able to back up this information with, uh, with is what are my skills like in finale to be able to quickly make these changes? What are my ability to be able to provide mock-ups for the musician to know what the charts are going to sound like? What does my LLC structure look like? I started to ask very different questions because as the work came in more, it started to really be about things that had nothing to do with music. And a large part of that was just about music business. It was just about automation. It was about um, tax structure. It was about hiring an assistant and all these other things that I didn't even, th that weren't even on my radar. But as I started to scale, I began to able to really have a split between my artist brain and my business brain. So that's one story that I like to share. The other one that I'll quickly do is the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I had always dreamed about having my own big band. I had toured with the Basie Orchestra for years. Um, done a lot of youth ensembles and you know taught at colleges with big bands, but never had my own big band. Um, I recently was able to lead the Paradise Jazz Series big band at Orchestra Hall, and that performance was actually birthed out of an opportunity that I created on Instagram of all places. So the story behind this one is beginning of the pandemic, all of a sudden we're all shut down. I'm like, oh yeah, for the next month or two, we're not going to be doing gigs. I'm sure we all thought that, right? And everybody reacted to the pandemic differently. You know, we think about like uh, fight, flight, or freeze. Everybody reacted. There's no judgment for the way that anybody reacted to the pandemic. For me, I went into this kind of like flight mode or, or fight mode or whatever. And I was just like, all right, what are the things that I can do? I'm pretty good with video. I'm pretty good, at like a pretty organized. I'm going to put together a virtual big band. And so my wife's like, what, what is, like, what's wrong with you? Like, just why don't you just take this time and rest? Like, you don't even know, you don't know how to edit these videos. Like, I'm going to figure it out. So I just sent some music, music to some musicians, told them, gave them instructions, invented a process that I wanted to use. And then the musicians sent their stuff back. And I put together this arrangement of Wayne Shorter's Yes or No. And all of a sudden, like a lot of people were into it. All the musicians really enjoyed doing it. No one got paid. I put in countless hours of work on it, but it felt so good. I was like, All right, I'm gonna keep going and see what happens with this. So I just started doing more and doing more and doing more. Next thing I know, it caught the attention of my mentor, Kamal Kenyatta. And he's like, hey, I wanna pay your band to record an arrangement you do of one of my tunes. So all of a sudden I'm like, wait, I can pay all the musicians to do something they were doing for free? So I started scaling the business. Then all of a sudden I started doing some commissions, started doing some, uh, getting hired to record videos for other groups. Then what was really fascinating is all of a sudden I'm talking to Chris Harrington, who used to work for the DSO. He's like, yeah, I was just talking with Terrence Blanchard. And he said, hey, have you heard of this guy, Chris Johnson out of Detroit? I love his big band. And my jaw dropped because Terrence is like my hero. And I'm thinking like, wait, Everybody talks about how social media is just complete like BS and there's, it is, there's so much BS to cut through, but do you mean I just like Terrence just paid attention to something I did on social media? Next thing I know I'm sending, I'm, I'm in a zoom call with him with some DSO donors and I'm like, Terrence, I would just be honored to work with you. I'm just like totally fanboying. And he's like, man, I would love that too. Months went by, nothing happened. Next thing I know, I get a call from Chris Harrington. He's like, hey, we're putting together this big band. We want you to lead it. Um, Terrence is the curator of our series, and he wants he's going to be a guest artist with you. We want you to put it together. And that's how I got that gig. It wasn't through the normal 
things and all the musicians I know that are connected to him that could have record. No, it came from him seeing a video I did on Instagram for free. But the point is though, is that for me, it's about that trying things, applying the scientific method, seeing what lands, seeing the results, and then allowing myself to scale from there by just being relentless in my desire to try more things and to be open to whatever was there. So the other challenge that I would have, or the other thing that maybe to put on people's mind is what are some ways in which you could step outside of your comfort zone and try some different things? And when you do that, what infrastructure do you have in place or are you lacking to be able to put together and to be able to be successful in those ventures? If I teach this masterclass right now, what I every time I teach a business masterclass, I'm like, man, the number one question I get is, oh, wow, you, you have online courses. Do you have one on music business yet? I'd love to see that. And I'm like, dang it, I don't have the infrastructure set up yet. So I'm working on, I already have the curriculum typed up. I haven't recorded the videos. I already know what I want to do. I can't wait to be able to do that. And I'm like, all right, great. Sign up for my email list and I'll send everybody the masterclass. But I'm constantly thinking about the infrastructure of how do I take the information that I have? How do I take the skill that I have or, or the, the musical talent that I have and find ways to be able to be a good steward of that in order to be you know, financially successful and continue to support the ability to make more music? Because that's really what, what this is all about. All right, I just talked for a really long time. Uh, questions or comments that come up for anybody? I'd like to mention that the, the concert you did at Orchestra Hall, Chris, was outstanding. The arrangements were wonderful. The musicians were great. I think you had Terrence Blanchard and Kurt Elling there, and it was just a marvelous production. So congratulations. Thank you so much. That means a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody? Any other brave souls? All right, so let's dig deeper, a little bit deeper into infrastructure. This is the way that I see a lot of times I get the question of, okay, great. Yeah, I know I'm supposed to have a website. I know I'm supposed to have this. I want to talk to you a little bit about the process of the why. I think a lot of times the idea is, oh, you should have an LLC set up. Oh, you should have a website. You need to have a social media presence. But there isn't really a lot of conversation about conversion and about scaling and about why those things are important. So I want to give an example that I think everyone will be able to relate to. I think the most common example that we see in the gigging world is, oh, if I have a CD recorded, if I have a CD recorded, then when I do a live gig, I can make more money by selling the CD. That is a perfect example of a conversion. That's a perfect example of scaling up. That's a perfect example of I went from making $200 on this gig to making $400 on this gig because I sold $200 worth of merch. There are so many other ways in which we can incorporate that. Now, if it is your calling to say, I have special arrangements of these charts and someone can buy the CD, they can buy the arrangement of the chart from my website, or I'm selling this online course, or I teach private lessons. There's all these extra things that we do. And every time we're in front of an audience, we have the opportunity to be able to build on that. So a great example of that, if we think about like the circle that we have going, let's say that tomorrow I do a social media post. And I'm doing a social media post and I'm talking specifically about some nerdy theory thing. And I play an example on my trumpet. It's like, all right, cool. Here's this like line that uses a tritone substitution. And I play it. I do a little bit of explaining. Now it's just like, I just put that out there. Great. And let's say that that video reaches 2000 people. Now, generally speaking, if you have an extra offer, maybe 1% of people will actually take a, a, a step further. So if I reach 2,000 people and then 1% of people will actually take a further step, step, great. Put a video out there, it reaches 2,000 people, and at the end I say, hey, if you want to learn more about this, uh, you should go buy my course, Progressions You Should Know. Now, immediately, a lot of times the, the, the mindset is, great, I put this video out there, and the goal is that every single person that watches this video goes and buys the course. But if we change that mindset and we change it from being a direct sale, we have to offer something else extra. So one step that I've studied uh, is really the, the idea of using sales funnels. 
So now the idea is, okay, I put something free out there that reached 2,000 people. 1% so about 20 people might actually click the link. Now, if they click the link and it just takes them directly to the course and they get directly to the course and they say, oh, man, this costs 99 bucks. Nope. And they click away. And that's what's going to happen with the majority of people. Maybe 1% of that, so like 0.2 people will actually buy the product. But if I offer something else free and I'm able to capture the, the people's information and continue to provide them with more resources, then I can create some longevity in the way that we're reaching people. So the way that a lot of times these sales funnels are set up, and forgive me if you guys are already familiar with this, is let's say that I reach 2,000 people with a video. Then I have it and say, hey, you want a free lesson on Tritone Substitutions? Just hit the link in my bio. They're like, oh, man, everybody loves free. They'll go sign up for that. Let's say that I'm able to get 10% of people. I'm able to get 200 people to actually click the link because they're going to get a free lesson and a free PDF. Great. They go in order to do that. Hey, all you got to do is type in your email address. Just sell me your information. Type in your email address. Go here and watch this free lesson. Man, I'll get this free lesson. Then... You start getting a series of emails. We've all done it before. We've all been hit with this before with different products that we signed up for free. But then after a while, it's like, man, this is, if it's a really good product and it's really convincing, now suddenly I'm looking at my conversion rate of that 200. And if my conversion rate is still 10%, even if I only get 20 of those people to consider buying the course, now suddenly I went from trying to do a direct sale of 2,000 people down to maybe 1% of those people who would even click the link. Now suddenly I'm looking at, man, I might be able to get 20 people to actually buy this course. And if my infrastructure is set up right, then I don't have a problem. Now here's the issue. Let's say that it's just built around something as simple as a private lesson, because I know not everybody's going to go out and create an online course. If it's not automated, then suddenly there's a lot more labor involved than what we need. So let's say that it's not automated where somebody clicks on it, they have to send you an email, then you guys are going back and forth talking about, oh man, I got to go back and forth and, and discuss lesson times and all these other things. And it becomes frustrating for the student and maybe it falls through. But if you have it go to, here's a, a tool we can use. It's called Calendly. Now suddenly you have all your availability for the upcoming week that's already set. Where a student goes, they fill out a form with all their information, what they want to study, and it takes them somewhere where they can prepay for that lesson. So you don't have to worry about them wasting their time. And they get a slot on Calendly, they can see when you're available and times that you've told you want. They click that, they sign up for their lesson. Now suddenly they say, well, I've already paid for this. I already know when the availability is and you haven't had to lift a finger. And suddenly there's the $50, the $75 in your bank account. And you look at your schedule and say, all right, I'm teaching Sarah, you know, blah, 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 on Wednesday at 3 p.m., one of my time slots. Now I go teach that lesson. Now suddenly that's a very different model from having to go through Really having to go through. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the calendar software. Let me just type this in now. Calendly.com. And the great part is it's a free resource too. I'll type this in. Make sure I send to everyone. Great. And again, what starts to happen is we start to have these things set up and our mind, that small mind shift really starts to be able to have us to have a lot more retention for what we need. And anytime that we can, when we capture an email address, all these things that we have, anytime anything says, hey, here's a free product, it is not free. We're paying for two major things. Businesses are paying for two major things. Your contact information, which is worth a lot. And that's why there's so many laws set up around not selling your contact information. Because the more that you see it, and you're also paying for, that's going to get really nerdy and technical, I apologize. But you're also paying for the cookies that are stored. You know, you go on every website. And you got to hit the thing like, yes, I accept the cookies. And we all just accept it willy-nilly. Yes, I allow you to store the cookie on my computer or whatever. We think it's really not that big of a deal. And I'd say, you know, most people don't know what's being done with that information. There was a time before that started happening where the cookies were just stored and they didn't have to ask for permission. What's really happening is this. There's, just, there's like a widget that uh, gets stored where now if I wanted to, let's say that you put in your email address or you clicked on my link or you even looked at the comments on an advertisement. As soon as you do that on an advertisement for something for free, now as a business owner, I'm able to create targeted ads that say, all right, well, Miss Mickey clicked on this link and I have the information for the people that specifically clicked on my link. 
I'm going to create an ad that's going to directly target this person to say, please buy this course, or here's some more information. If you're on the fence about buying this particular product, you can do X, Y, Z. The whole point, if we're not going to go through all this, is that there are so many techniques that stand on the other side of research. And if we're able to be objective about our practice and we're able to be objective about how we want to scale, and it's going to look completely different for everybody, if we're able to be objective and we start to become truly become students of the technology and the business practices that are available, then we can start to see a different level of success. And maybe it isn't a lesson. Maybe it's an advertisement for a CD. Maybe it's a music book that you're doing. Whatever it might be, if we start to get strategic about studying this information and understanding what's available, then we can see our business scale. We can see us having more financial success and see us having more support for the things that we want to accomplish in our careers. And that's really what, what I'm about. And there are people that do this and it's very... Um, you know, it feels very icky. Like, oh man, you're selling my information and you're trying to target me. When you really think about it, if you have a good product, you're not doing anything icky. I don't think twice. I've, I have not unsubscribed for, from so many things that I see the emails from and I open the email and check it out. All right, what's Best Buy got going on? I'm never like Best Buy is trying to take advantage of me because they have my information. No, I, I signed up for this. Let me hear about the information. And the thing is, and this is key, is that if we're in this mindset of, oh, I don't want to bug people or, oh, I don't want to do that, then we are not really going to see the level of success that we want to have. But if we're relentless with it, what happens to that conversion rate that we talked about? Well, if I got 2,000 people to watch this video, I got 10% of that, so 200 people to actually click the link. Out of that, I got 10%, so 20 people to actually buy the product. What would happen if I reached 20,000 people and had a similar conversion rate? So what if I got 20,000 people to watch the video by putting a boost on this video that led them to click the link? And now I got 2,000 people that click the link because I'm offering a free product. And now I got 200 people that buy the course. What would happen? Now, I'm not saying I have all figured out. Don't worry, I'm not selling like 200 courses like on the regular. I'm, but I'm working towards that and there are people that are doing it. All it is though is understanding the process of business and the process and the importance of failing. And right now, as it compares to playing the trumpet, or as it compares to teaching music, or as it compares to arranging music, I am in the infant stage of developing certain business practices when it comes to sales funnels. But I am just as curious about figuring out that process as I was about learning how to play Ladybird. I am just as curious about a backdoor 251 as I am now about figuring out how I can convert my leads because it's what's serving me in this moment to be able to be successful from a business standpoint. And ultimately, the reason why it matters is I want to find any means necessary in order to support my career as a musician and to be able to continue to be an artist and to be able to continue to think about how can I take these things and move them forward and find more success? How can I set up more future success for my sons? It's just about being a good steward of the gifts that we've been given. So I think when we start thinking this way, it's about finding how does this apply to me because it's going to be different from everybody. Uh, I did see one question, more info on YouTubing. Absolutely. Um, to me, whether it be Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, whatever it might be, if we're consistent and we're consistently creating content that people want to see, consistently experimenting with the content that we produce that people want to see. It's not about, oh, I want to get a million YouTube subscribers. Or I want to do this. It's more so about if I have 50 followers on YouTube, but there are 50 people who truly, truly care about my art. Just picture for a second. Right now we say, oh yeah, 50 followers on YouTube when like this person has a million, uh, whatever. But imagine if right now, if you could walk out into your living room and there were 50 people waiting there, just sitting there in your living room waiting for you to play a concert for them. That's really what's happening on social media if we have people that are truly following us. And when we're consistent, then we'll see that start to grow on any particular platform. And then it's also an opportunity for us to hone our craft. And really, I think the biggest thing is 
you can't overthink it either. Really the consistency. If I follow somebody, what I'm really looking for is, hey, whatever you did, even if it's from your cell phone of like, hey, I'm practicing this today. I'm interested in it because I love the way you sound. Scott posted a video today and I I heart the mess out of that and comment like, Scott, you sound great, man. I love hearing you play that because that's why I'm there. That's what I signed up for. I think sometimes we put it in our heads like, oh, it's got to be the super produced. I'm making these like multi-frame videos and all this stuff because I am a nerd. I'm a nerd. I like the way this stuff is. It's fun for me, but I'll never forget. My wife and I did this video. There's a um this song called Cry Today, Smile Tomorrow. Beautiful song. It was featured in the Spike Lee series. Um, She's Gotta Have It. Oh my God, it was so beautiful. And we did a cover of it. I arranged some like virtual strings and I played keys and she sung it. We had the lighting set up. And the video did okay. People kind of liked it. The next night I'm wearing a boondocks hoodie. It's the it's like the middle of the night and somebody tagged me in a West End Blues challenge. Like play Louis Armstrong's opening to West End Blues. And I was like, all right, hey babe, just take my phone, shoot a video. I didn't warm up. And beep, 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 boop, boop, beep, 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 recorded it one take, posted it. It's got like thousands of views. And I'm like, I am both I'm both equally frustrated and excited about the fact that I could put hours into producing this one video and it gets like no love but i could put minutes into producing this other one it gets a lot of love but to me that was that funnel okay what do i do with this information post more casual content that's what works in that particular moment do your highly produced stuff because it feels good to you but don't forget to be consistent i'd rather see somebody post at the same time 10 a.m whatever the time is that you find you have success Every single Monday is a starting point. I know I'm going to post one video at 10 a.m. every Monday and see what happens. Then once I have that data and I see the kind of likes and the follows that it gets, let me try 11 a.m. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, what do I do with that information? This did really, really well. And exactly. Surprise people with joyful moments. Absolutely. All of a sudden at 11 a.m. It's like, man, the switch from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Now I'm going to post at 11 a.m. consistently every Monday and see if it makes a difference. Oh man, wow, that's getting more engagement. There's more people sign up for my email list. There's more people buying my course. 11 a.m. Now I'm going to post on Monday and Thursday. Thursday, 11 a.m. doesn't work. All right, I'm going to switch the, the Thursday to 12. It's just about experimentation. And when we get into that mindset, it's just as playful as if I press my valve down halfway, it's going to make a different sound on that B than if I push it down all the way. Or if we try a different technique, I'm going to growl on this point, or I'm going to sing this in a half step lower. It's the exact same process we go through, but if we allow ourselves to be playful and we allow ourselves to experiment, then suddenly we start to find more success. And all that means, all that means is more opportunity to continue to be the artist that we are. Awesome. Cool. Uh, you are all for this. I'm making sure I answer all these questions here. Uh, Ramsey, thank you so much. Um, Ramsey left because the kids are dragging away. I fully understand. Yep. Great. Surprise people with joyful moments. Consistent. Absolutely. Experimentation. And I will say too, I feel like seeds that I planted 10 years ago are finally starting to sprout. And some of them are like seeds I forgot about. And it's like, oh, shoot. Okay. That's starting to come up. What infrastructure do I have set up to make sure that that can be successful? Or am I starting from scratch? Questions, thoughts, emotional outbursts that this brings up for anybody. I appreciate the, the commentary in the, in the chat that makes me feel less lonely in this virtual environment. If anybody's feeling brave enough, I just want to hear some voices too if anybody wants to chime in. Um, if your YouTube and Instagram didn't get attention, do you ever repost? Oh, absolutely. Even if it does. I think one of the, the greatest things we can do too is sometimes it's really nice to follow people who have, you know, millions and millions of likes or followers, whatever. We could also study people who have successfully have 10,000. What are some of the practices they do? And I love kind of looking at people's posting habits. I don't skip over liking a video because it's a repost. If I watch, I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that video. <laughs> Double click, LOL, I remember this one. Share to my story. This is great. I've been looking for this. Oftentimes, absolutely. 
And as you like, if you move up from like, let's say you have, you know, 500 followers and you move up to 600 followers, guess what? There's a hundred people that didn't see it the first time. They didn't do a deep dive. Absolutely. Hey, listen, throwback Thursday and flashback Friday exist for a reason. Don't be afraid to reuse it. I reuse stuff all the time. And that's the thing. If you don't know what to post, just post something you've already posted again. I think the difference is though, is let's think about what appeals to us. If I'm interested in a car, I'm interested in buying a car. I don't want some slimy person in front of me. Buy this car, buy the car. You got to buy this car. You got to do this thing. Got to do this thing. Got to do this thing. Instead, it's like, okay, we both know I'm here to buy a car. Let's just relax. Let's just all just calm down a little bit. Instead, what it becomes is, hey, what questions do you have? Or, hey, let me just show off what's on my lot. I know you're searching, but I'm not going to approach you with them and let you come to me. This is what's going on. This is what we have in the lot. Here are the deals that we're running. And it's as simple as that. Instead of it always being a push, push, push. And the call to action could be really simple. Hey, just come see what we have rather than you have to do this. And when you start mixing it up and it's suddenly like, yo, all right, here's something that's happened with my family. If I'm comfortable doing that, here's a gig that I just did. Here's something that's coming up or here's just a picture of my workspace, whatever it might be. You have to experiment and you'll find what people are into. I am sometimes amazed sometimes completely amazed at what people are into, or I'll think I shouldn't repost that. Then I repost it. And it's like, man, I got more love than it did the first time. So absolutely repost content. I, I highly recommend that. The other part of it too, is we also live in a culture and the culture of social media right now is not just reposting your own stuff. Part of it is like, whether it's in the stories or even on your page, you see something inspiring, use the repost app or, or whatever, or screen record it, tag that person and say, wow, such and such left a really, really great message for us today. Check this out. And that's, it's not copyright infringement. That's just the world that we're in right now that it's totally okay to do that. If I don't have something of my own, I'm just going to repost what somebody else did. And you'd be amazed. And some, some of those cases, that person might start interacting with some of your content. You never know. And the goal isn't, ooh, more followers, more followers. Think of the goal as being, I want more engagement. I want the people who care about me and care about my art to have more opportunity to engage with me in my art. Because think of it this way. If I was playing a gig, I could be playing a gig at freaking Carnegie Hall. But what if I was playing a gig at Carnegie Hall and everybody was on their cell phone watching the Lakers game? I'd be miserable. But what if I was playing a gig and doing a house concert at somebody's house and 30 people were there, but everyone was just dialed in and just leaning forward and just watching everything and, and clapping and, and really sit, you know, sitting at the edge of their seat watching it. I'd rather that than to be in front of a huge audience of people who don't really care about what's going on. That's one way to kind of hack the way that we think about social media. If you have 30 followers, that's 30 people who really care about you. If you have 100, that's great. Aim for reaching people that actually care about you and actually care about what you're doing and what you're passionate about. And it doesn't matter how many. It's about the engagement. Then the people that are engaged are the people that are going to show up to your concert. The people that are engaged are the people that are going to buy your product. The people that are engaged are the people that are going to make you feel good and make you continue to do what you're doing. Now, as you're growing, the hope is that you'll be able to keep a similar ratio. If one-third of the people that follow me are engaged my hope is that at 300 i had 100 people who are really engaged at 3000 you know what i mean etc cetera, etc cetera, rather than just having a whole bunch of numbers that don't mean anything because they don't actually care about it awesome scott i know at some point you got to start driving i know we said we're going to keep it close to six but i'm happy to answer any other questions if anything else popped up you guys have been great thank you so much for this i, I can hang for an extra minute and, and even then, if if uh, if if we go over that, I can I can always just leave let leave it going, and, and my wife can um, finish it off here. Okay. Other questions, comments, concerns from anybody? My absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you all for that feedback. I really appreciate it. It's wonderful, Chris, that you're sharing this with our. Michigan Jazz Festival audience and community. We appreciate it very much. Um, of you're part of about 15 clinics that we've done throughout the year and Scott's very much involved in facilitating those. Uh, we do a lot of that together and we've been greatly looking forward to your 
session today, and you've been inspiring and in giving us a lot of good ideas. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. Is there, guys, this is la last chance. Any uh, I see a question here about co collaborations, how to make them go easy, right. easy and fairly. Uh, one point that I'll bring up a, a couple of things with that is, you know, obviously, and, and this again, I, I know you, you know this information, but I will say the thing that's important to me is, of course, choosing the people you're working with, being careful about that. But I think one thing that people find surprising that I just want to share, I think everybody can benefit from is I think it's always important to document whatever arrangements are made. Uh, people are shocked at this. My, my wife is an accomplished uh, vocalist and actress, and people are shocked to hear when we work on a project, we still do a written agreement. We absolutely still do a written agreement. We sit down, we talk, all right, we're doing this project. What's our split going to be? Who owns this part? What's the copyright going to say? How are we working this? Is it going to be like, what's this going to be? Absolutely. It's still business at the end of the day. I am very, very consistent with making sure that I do a written agreement with whoever I'm working with, even if it's, even if it's something as simple as an email just to document, because questions always come up later. I think that's really important. I think the other part of it too is that I'm really, really obsessed with file organization and really, really obsessed with the process that is set up. If I'm noticing something and I'm collaborating with someone, I'm noticing we run into the same issue. My thought is, okay, great. It's not about the songwriting. It's not about our talent. This is really an infrastructure issue. So I'm looking at like, I'm working on music for a musical. To me, it's logical. Okay, I want to have a click track set up for every single musician. I want them to have their vocal part that's in their ear. I want to make sure that I have a Dropbox that's organized. I don't want to have to make the musicians work too hard. Every single time I can do a gig, and actually Scott can attest to this because we just went through it, I'm going to make a, a separate Dropbox folder for that particular gig. I'm going to toss the MP3s and the PDFs in that folder. I'm going to share it with the musicians and communicate the set list and just make it easy rather than, all right, here's a list of tunes. Uh, here's a list of tunes, everybody go figure it out. Or here's my entire Dropbox of everything I've ever written. Here's the set list, figure it out. I try to make things convenient for the musician. My thought is if, if five people are going to be on a gig and five people are going to have to go through and do work, how about I just, as the band leader, do the extra steps that are necessary in order to make everybody's lives easier? If five people are going to have to go out and find the changes for this song or find the particular arrangement I want to do, how about I just take a minute and just write out the arrangement? I'm going to take the time to do that so that this musician can just show up and just play. It's hard enough playing music and doing the things that we do. To me, it's really about having that empathy too as a band leader. And then also too, as a part of infrastructure, understanding that it is not only completely normal, but 100% recommended that we're taking leader fees. Um, and I'm sure we all think about this, but usually the calculation I love to give um, as people are asking this, because it comes up a lot is if Scott hired me for a gig tomorrow and said, Chris, this gig pays $250, never, ever would I ever be like, well, well how much are you getting paid, Scott? That's none of my business. Am I willing to do the gig for two fifty? dollars Scott could be making $3,000 and it wouldn't make a difference. I'm happy to do the gig or I'm not happy to do the gig. But the point is for me, usually as a fair point, I like to think of just adding another virtual band member. So let's say I have a quartet. I'm going out to do a gig. The gig pays $1,000. A lot of times, people are of the mindset of, great, that's four people, that's $1,000, we're all getting paid two fifty. dollars No, there's five people. Because there's Chris Johnson as the trumpet player, but there's also Chris Johnson as the person who had to go out and get the gig. There's also Chris Johnson as the person who has to arrange this music and organize, but I'm going to earn that. I'm going to put it together and make it easy for my band. So now I'm going to divide that number by five as a minimum. Divide that number by five, and everybody gets paid 200 I get paid 200 to play trumpet, but I should be getting paid 200 as well to be able to put all this music together. Now, I have a rule personally that if musicians are making any less than what my minimum is to do a gig, then I don't take the leader fee. If the musicians are like, oh, we're all just making 100 bucks, then okay, everybody's making 100 bucks. Or I've done gigs where I was like, hey, listen, as the band leader, I'm not even taking a cut of this. I want, this is a big opportunity for me. I'm going to make sure you guys get paid. I'm not going to get paid. That happens from time to time. When we get that big gig, we see $3,000. Is it an equal amount of work? Is it, Are there things we can do to make this gig easier for somebody else? Did they put in the same amount of work? It's totally acceptable to do that. And I think when that mindset shift happens, we really think about if I work at Guitar Center and Guitar Center makes $10,000 that day, does my pay rate change? Maybe I have a commission. 
But ultimately, it's not going to go up terribly. I'm just an employee. I'm just there. I'm there to serve a particular particular role. But the reason why Guitar Center can make that money is because on the days that they don't make money, you still get paid. And it's okay for us to have that same mindset with the musicians that we work with. Sorry, I got really passionate about that. And Christina, I saw your note. Yeah, I'm working on the uh, the, the business of music. So yes, yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm on top of that. And thank you, Miss Mickey. It was such a pleasure to work with, with you with uh, with Hastings Street. Truly, you just you knocked that out of the park. And again, that was my hope is I try to make it just easy for everybody to learn their music. It's it's difficult enough. Sometimes doing these gigs is hard enough. So as a leader, my goal is just to make it as easy as possible for everyone. Well, Chris, I, we really appreciate you coming in and uh, giving this this great advice to us. And um, I think you spelled it out really clearly. And this will be this will be up on our Michigan Jazz Festival site. So if anybody knows um, anyone that this might be valuable to, they can they can see this video there. But uh, I want to extend from the Michigan Jazz Festival my thanks to you for doing this, and um, we hope to see you sometime somewhere soon we'll be looking really appreciate it thank you so much for having me yep thanks everybody thanks